स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया Let's talk about generators and relations for uh, symmetric groups. We have already done an instance of this uh, in the previous problem session when we looked at the symmetric group S3 okay, and recall we said that there exists a surjective homomorphism from the free group on two generators to S3. Okay, we constructed such a map. Now how did we define this map? Uh, let us call this map pi, it was given by the following, you map the generator A to the transposition 1, 2 and B to the transposition 2, 3, mapped it to the two simple transpositions and uh, if you specify the values on A and B, uh, that is enough to give you a group homomorphism from the corresponding free group, that is by the universal property of the free group. Okay. Uh, we said a few things about pi. So, pi is an onto map, it is surjective. Why is that? Because 1, 2 and 2, 3 together generate the group S3, that is one. Now, uh, what we want to do really when we say uh, generators and relations, so the word relations is really uh, something to do with the kernel of pi. So, what we want to do is to understand what the kernel of this homomorphism looks like. Okay? Now, uh, there are some obvious elements in the kernel which we can uh, immediately write down. So, let me give you a few um, elements of the kernel. Uh, before that, recall that the kernel, well, what is it? It is certainly a normal subgroup of, this is a normal subgroup, as we know, of the free group. So, let me just abbreviate uh, the free group to F now. Uh, so, this is property 1, the kernel and here are some elements in the kernel. So, observe that uh, the element 1, 2, the transposition has a square identity. Okay? So, if I similarly look at the square of this, this word A, in other words, let me look at the word A occurring twice. And recall that elements of the free group are all equivalence classes of words. So, I look at the word AA and if I compute what its image under pi is, then here is what I will observe. Pi of AA is nothing but pi of A, pi of A because pi is a homomorphism. And this is just 1, 2 times 1, 2, the square of this and that is just the identity. So, let me um, write id for the identity element of the group S3. Now, similarly, uh, more or less by a similar calculation, I also take the word BB and observe that its image under pi is also going to be the identity. Okay, so, what does this mean? It means that I know some elements of the kernel the word AA is in the kernel, the word BB is in the kernel, okay, these are both elements of the kernel of pi. In fact, there is another, yet another word which now involves both A and B which we can write down. So, I will leave space for that. So, what is that? Well, let us look at uh, the product of the two. So, suppose I take a word AB which is the product of the words A and B and I compute the image of that under pi, it is pi a pi b, that is the product 1, 2, 2, 3, which is the 3 cycle 1, 2, 3 in S3 and we know that 3 cycles have order 3, if you raise it to the power 3, then it just gives you the identity. So, what this means is, so observe 1, 2, 3 being a 3 cycle, if I cube it, I get the identity. So, in particular, it means if I compute the image of pi under the cube of this word. So, I take a b whole cubed. What is a b whole cubed? That is just the word a b a b a b. So, I just repeat a b thrice. 
So if I compute this, then that's going to be the identity again. Okay. So what that means is that I can write out another word. So this is just a b a b a b. And these three words certainly belong to the kernel of this uh, homomorphism pi. Okay. Now, uh, what we are going to claim is that in some sense, these are these are the three words that you need. These are all the, the words that you need. Okay. So, here is the, the proposition. Proposition. The kernel of pi is just the normal subgroup generated by these three words. It is the normal subgroup of the free group generated by these three words okay which is a a so generated by the set containing these three words okay so what is the the terminology normal subgroup generated by something mean uh, that just means you take the smallest normal subgroup of the ambient group which contains the given subset so, this is just um, sort of the obvious definition. So, definition uh, given a subset, given a subset of a group, given a subset T of a group G, uh, the normal subgroup generated by T is just the intersection of all normal subgroups. So, let us call it n prime. Uh, what is n prime? n prime is a normal subgroup of G which contains the given set T. Okay? And it is an easy exercise to check that when you intersect an arbitrary collection of normal subgroups, the answer is still a normal subgroup. Okay, arbitrary intersections of normal subgroups uh, is a normal subgroup again. And so, the intersection of all normal subgroups which contain a given set is necessarily a normal subgroup and that is called the normal subgroup generated by uh, the given set T. Okay. So, in our case, so let us come back to our situation. So, we said take the set comprising uh, A, 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 B and A, A, B whole cube. So, it is sort of cumbersome to keep writing this again and again. So, I will just call this word a square b square. So, just mild abuse of notation here and I will call this a b whole cubed is just the word a b a b a b. <coughs> so, I am dropping the, the sort of the square brackets for the equivalence classes. Okay. So, I claim that so let n be the, the normal subgroup generated by these three elements by a square b square and a b whole cubed and I claim uh, so we need to prove really uh, which is the proposition to prove the proposition what I am claiming is that n is exactly the kernel of pi. Okay. So, recall that is the proposition. The kernel is exactly the normal subgroup generated by these three elements. So, let me give the normal subgroup generated by these three elements a name. I am calling it n and I am going to show that n is the same as kernel of pi. Now, what we know, so let us prove the claim. What we have just said, so we know the following uh, that the kernel contains n. We know the following, we know that uh, the kernel contains n, right? because the three elements which generate n are all in the kernel and the kernel is a normal subgroup. So, n is the smallest normal subgroup containing those three guys, it is the intersection of all the normals. And so, in particular, uh, n has to be contained inside the kernel of pi. So, that is the first thing we know. There is another thing we know, we know that the free group modulo the kernel, the quotient group by the 
first isomorphism theorem for groups or the fundamental theorem of group homomorphisms says that this is in fact homomorphic or rather uh, isomorphic to the image of this map okay to the image of the map from f to s3 so i have an isomorphism and recall what is this what does this isomorphism do if i take an element uh, g in f and i look at the coset g kernel pi right the coset of g is just mapped to pi of g that's what this this map does okay that is the isomorphism that comes from the the given map pi so maybe i'll call this map pi bar um, which is just induced by pi okay so i know that this is an isomorphism so pi bar is an isomorphism of groups okay it's an isomorphism now let's look at uh, uh, n now so let's look at f by n let's look at the quotient f by n i claim that since n is contained inside the kernel of pi there is actually a map from f by n to f by the kernel okay and this is in fact a surjective map so we usually indicated by this this double arrow here uh, what is this map so this is again a general fact so maybe we'll write this down here separately here's a general facts which uh, fact which works for all groups and normal subgroups and so on so suppose i have two normal subgroups suppose i have n1 contained inside n2 okay they are both normal subgroups of a given group g so let's say n1 and n2 are both normal then uh, i can talk about the the two quotient groups so there is this group g mod n1 and there is the group g modulo n2 g by n2 and what i have is a map there always exists a map from g by n1 to g by n2 a subjective map okay so we'll call this psi maybe and what does this map do well it, the most obvious thing takes a coset of g uh, with respect to n1 the left coset to the left coset g n2 okay so this is the obvious uh, thing to do and here's a, a simple exercise check that psi is in fact a homomorphism of groups that it is on to and in fact its kernel the kernel of this map is exactly well what is it it's everything which maps to the identity coset so that's going to be uh, all elements or uh, the cosets of elements from n2 so this is usually what we call n2 by n1 okay so n2 by n1 just means i take all cosets g n1 where g comes from n2 Okay, so it's sort of a short aside um, on um, homomorphisms between such quotient groups. Now, the, our situation is similar. We have, in fact, f by n and f by kernel pi. n is contained in the kernel, and so actually, I have a map from f by n. That's a coset of n maps to the coset g kernel pi, which in turn maps isomorphically to S three um, under the map pi bar. Okay, so g kernel pi goes to pi g. Okay, great. So I have through this, I have managed to get a sequence. Uh, I have managed to get a homomorphism from f by n, which surjects onto S three. Let's call this psi. So uh, in effect, let's uh, just give the whole thing a name. So this map now, which goes from f by n to S three. So this is just pi bar composition with psi, is an uh, is a surjective homomorphism. okay now what we are uh, trying to prove really is that n and the kernel of pi are the same and if that were true then of course you can see that this map psi would just be sort of like the identity map between them and this this composition here would just be the same as the original map pi bar okay now uh, so what i claim is the following so let's let's prove this as follows we claim that this group f by n that we don't know much about at this point is in fact a finite group and has at most uh, three factorial elements or at most six elements so six is three factorial in this case which is the number of elements in s3 i claim f by n has at most six elements uh, we'll prove this uh, in just a second but uh, observe that if we assume that the claim is proved then it automatically shows that 
uh, n and kernel pi are equal. Okay, so for the moment, assume the claim. Assuming the claim, let's see what what we can deduce. So observe because f by n uh, surjects onto S three f by n must have at least six elements right because i have an on two mark which sort of goes down to uh, a set of six elements then the 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 other set on the other side should have at least those many elements right just a property of on two maps and on the other hand the claim says that this has at most six elements so assuming the claim observe we would conclude that f by n in fact has exactly six elements okay because the on two ness gives you the other inequality and what does this mean? This in turn would imply that this map that we have constructed pi bar composition, sorry, pi bar composition psi is in fact an isomorphism because it's both one to one and on two now. It's an isomorphism of groups. Now, if that is an isomorphism of groups, then the only option, I mean, pi bar was already an isomorphism. The only option is that psi is also an isomorphism. So, psi is also an isomorphism. Okay. And uh, what would that imply? That means in particular that psi is a, is a one to one map. Psi was already on to claim a psi is one to one. Now observe, we, we sort of know what the kernel of psi looks like. Kernel of psi is just the quotient n2 by n1. In this case, it is just uh, kernel pi by n. Okay, So in our case, what would we get? We would get therefore that kernel of pi, which is known to be uh, uh, I'm sorry, kernel of psi, which is n2 by n1, which in this case is kernel pi by n, is just the trivial group. Okay, the kernel pi just has only the identity. That's exactly what we want to prove. Okay, and so we are done. So the proof is done. So assuming the claim, we are we are done. So all we need to do really is to prove this claim that this group f by n has at most six elements. And that's really where the, the heart of the proof is. And uh, for a start, we should observe that this is a very surprising fact uh, on the face of it because what are the elements of F itself? Well, the elements of F look like this. They are all words, the equivalence classes of words. And now we are saying, let's look at the cosets of, you take all possible words in F and look at their cosets. Uh, left cosets with n and this collection is finite has at most six elements okay but observe the number of words themselves is infinite right Re recall if i write words uh, i mean what are the elements of the free group words in a a prime b b prime there's an infinite uh, number of words i can write but somehow when you take cosets with n then this reduces to just a finite number okay so that's somehow the point so let's try this. Uh, let's see how this this finiteness would come about. Well, it it comes about because many different cosets should end up giving you the same answer. So I'm looking at all So this is my f by n. I claim that many cosets give me the same you know many w's give me the same coset. Okay? For example, so let's see uh, an instance of this. So let's look at the word A and let's look at its uh, sort of the, the inverse word, which is A prime. I claim A and A prime are actually the in the same coset modulo n. Okay, why is this? Well, let's prove this. Uh, how does one prove two things are in the same coset? You just look at A prime inverse. So you push this A prime over to the other side a prime inverse times a so you compute what this is well a prime inverse recall a prime was you know that word was the inverse of a in fact so this is a again so this is just a times a and so that's just the word a square or a a and recall because of the definition of n a a is in fact an element of n okay so this means exactly that these two cosets are equal that a prime inverse a belongs to n similarly the same thing holds for b, same proof, b n is the same as b prime n. So these are two examples of uh, different words which give you the same coset. And in fact, here's the here's the general uh, fact again. 
general fact about cosets of normal subgroups in groups. So, suppose I have n which is a normal subgroup of G and suppose I have two different uh, elements which have the same coset and suppose if x and y are two elements of the group which have the same uh, coset modulo n then in fact I can do the following I can hit x on the left and on the right by some two group elements that will have the same coset as uh, g1 y g2 n for all g1 and g2 in my group g. Okay. Uh, again proof is very simple let us prove this very quickly proof what is given is the following that x and y are in the same coset which means that x inverse y belongs to n this is what is given and what is it that we want to prove that uh, if I take g1 x g2 inverse g1 y g2 I need to prove that this is also an element of n. Okay, so, we just compute. So, let us see what would you get this equals uh, g2 inverse x inverse y g2. Uh, of course, the g1 inverse and g cancel each other off. So, I can get rid of them. Now, what is left is just g2 inverse x inverse y g2 and observe x inverse y was already in n that is the given data and this is just a conjugate of that okay? because n is a normal subgroup when you conjugate an element from n it is again an n. So, this is obviously in n. So, we are done. Okay? So, this little general fact is very useful it says that uh, once I know you know when when two elements are representatives of the same coset then hitting uh, stuff on the left and the right will again produce two representatives of the same coset. Okay, so, now let us look at uh, how that is going to be used in our case. So, I have A and A prime have the same coset. So, what that means is if I hit A on the left by any word and on the right by some word that is in the same coset as the corresponding operation to A prime. Okay, so, here is our corollary to our instance uh, to our situation. So, I take a word A another word its coset is the same as word a prime word n and this is true for all words w1 w2 okay so maybe i should really put the equivalence classes here but what does this mean this just says that if i take uh, any word so, so, what this means is suppose I have a, a word here which looks like this there is a bunch of letters there is an A in it and there is another bunch of letters then the coset of this word is going to be the same as well I take these letters keep these letters the same as they are here replace just the A with an A prime okay, and then keep these letters the same. So, you, you make only one change which is A changes to A prime then these two are in the same coset these two words are going to be in the same coset ok. So, again I am going to drop those uh, square brackets on the two sides ok. So, uh, you can replace an A with an A prime in a word and that does not change the uh, you know that that still gives you two things with the same coset ok. Similarly, uh, same thing for B and B prime ok. If I change uh, B with, with B prime then you know it just gives me another representative of the same coset ok. So, that is the the first uh, observation that you can change a's and b's a primes and b primes to a's and b's without changing the cosets. So, it is sort of enough therefore, to you know since I am trying to understand this I just want to know what are all the different how many different cosets can I get when I take different words w here. Okay. Well, the, uh, the thing is it is enough to restrict to words w which contains only a's and b's ok. Let us throw out the a primes and b primes because of this this fact here ok. So, it is enough to say let us look at cosets uh, of words which only involve a and b ok. So, such cosets must be the same as the collection of all cosets ok. Now, how many such cosets are there? So, we need a few more reductions now. So, here is uh, reduction number 3 
which says if this word, so I'm now remember W is a word only with A's and B's, if W contains two successive A's or two successive B's, two successive A's or B's, then I can delete those two, then uh, that can be deleted without changing the coset of W, can be deleted. Okay, in other words, more formally, if W looks like word W1, A, A, W2, then the coset of W is the same as the coset of W1, W2, as I have deleted the A's from it. Hey, why is this? Well, it is again an instance of the same general principle that I talked about, proof. Recall A square, which is A, A, is the same as, uh, so in fact, A, A, N is the same as just the empty word n okay, because a a is an element of n to begin with. So, a a and the empty word both have the same coset which means I can hit stuff on the left and the right and I will still get things in the same coset okay, which implies well exactly this fact that w 1 a a w 2 and w 1 empty word w 2 have the same coset. Okay, same thing with b's instead of a's. So, this is the next reduction principle it says you can throw out two consecutive occurrences of A's or B's without changing the coset of your word. Okay, so now that is uh, that's the important uh, reduction. So, now let us try and list out all the different possible cosets. So, I am going to try and list uh, all cosets of the form Wn. Okay, and where I will use my various reduction rules, I won't list uh, cosets which are, you know, which can be obtained using different representatives. So here are my different cosets. So number one, I can just take the coset of n, the the coset n itself. That's empty word n. Then I can look at the coset a n. I can look at the coset of b b n. Uh, so, remember I, I have to look at all possible W's which involve A's and B's which do not have two consecutive A's or two consecutive B's. Now, uh, the next possibility therefore becomes A B N, 5 B A N, 6. Uh, so, now I look at words of length 3, I can look at A B A N, 7 is B A B N. Now, I look at words of length, uh, you know, 4 and 5 and so on. So, I, I, I just am, I am taking care not to have two successive A's or two successive B's, that is it. Okay. So, here is the, here is a list, it still looks like an infinite list, but here again comes the next reduction step. We claim that these two are actually equal to each other. These two cosets are in fact equal. Okay. So, that is the next observation claim the coset a b a n is the same as the coset b a b n. Okay, again proof, what do we need to do? Uh, we need to take one of them to the other side as inverse. So, look at b a b inverse a b a n and we need to uh, simplify this. So, remember b a b inverse is what? b inverse a inverse b inverse a b a n inverses remember are the same as primes b prime a prime b prime a b a n. Now, we have already proved the following that whenever you see primes in a word, you can replace the primes by the unprimed alphabet and that still gives you the same coset. So, uh, this element here has Okay. So, this is now B A B A B A N. Okay. Now, look at this, this word here B A B A B A that is well what is B A B A B A that is just the word B A cubed. Okay. So, I claim that this word B A cube is actually in N, but observe that the word B A cube is actually in N. Okay. Uh, how do we see this? So, re recall N had A B cubed and not B A cubed, but that is not uh, uh, too hard to change this to the other. 
So let's look at BA cubed inverse. Okay, so what is BA cubed inverse? It's now going to be uh, instead of BA, BA, BA uh, inverse, so it ends with an A, it will now be, um, so what is this? BA, BA, BA inverse. So I just have to write it out in the other order. So that's going to be A inverse, B inverse, A inverse, B inverse, A inverse, B inverse. But then recall I can change all the primes to the unprimed alphabets without changing the um, n. So this, so I, I have to put n's everywhere. So look at b a cubed n, it's the same as this, it's the same as this, which is the same as this, but then a b whole cubed is already in n, so this is just the same as. Okay, so what this means is that b a whole cubed is I mean, BA whole cubed n. So, so I have shown BA whole cubed inverse n is n. So, of course, that means that BA whole cubed inverse is an n. But then, if an element is an n, n is a subgroup. Of course, the uh, if the inverse is an n, the original element is also an n. Okay. So, what this means is, so this this proves what we set out to prove that the the word seven or the coset 7 is actually the same as the coset 6. Okay, So, you do not actually get the seventh guy in this list and well what we will now show is that you, you will not get the eighth guy or the ninth guy or the tenth guy. Every other word that we would have potentially written down will turn out to coincide with one of the first six words okay, or with one of the first six cosets. So, that is going to be our next uh, observation or fact or proposition claim if if w is a word in a b w is a word in a and b without two successive a's or b's without two successive a's or b's then the coset w n so let us forget the brackets now that w n uh, coincides or equals one of the cosets one through six in other words this list here empty a n b n a b n b a n or a b a n okay so we have already proved this for words whose length is at most three Right, because those are exactly the first seven guys that I have written here and seven turns out to give me the same answer as six. Okay, but what if my words were longer? So, in some sense, we just have to prove this by, by induction. So, to get a sense of the proof, you should probably just work out uh, the next few cases. But this proof is really by induction on the length of this word, induction on the length of this word w. So, observe that uh, so, I proved it already for lengths, length equals 1, 2, 3, we are done. Now, if length is at, at least 4, suppose the length of w looks, uh, if w has length at least 4, then what does w look like? Well, remember it is a word with a's and b's, no successive a's or b, two successive a's or b's. So, let for example, suppose the last letter was an a, okay, we, we can repeat the same argument with b as well. But if the last letter is an A, then the letter preceding it must be a B, again A. And remember length of W is at least 4, which means I surely have at least one more B. After that, I do not know what happens. There could be more letters, there may not be more letters. I do not I don't know. So, I will just put dots there. Okay, it, it may or may not exist. Okay, so W looks like this. So, let me look at the coset of W now. W n is what is this? This is dot 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 b a b a n. Okay, but uh, remember a b a n that is the coset number 6 is the same as coset number 7 which was b a b n. Okay, So, by this general principle that we talked about earlier, this can therefore be written as words until b and I will just replace the last three guys a b a with b a b. This only replaces the last three with an n. Okay, now let us stare at this. So, we already observed some simplification which is that the two b's occur next to each other. 
so that's going to cancel or give me the identity so this becomes uh, so I, I delete the the b's and let's see what i get i get the same three dots whatever was there the b's are gone and now i have a b n okay now look at this 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 new expression that i have gotten what is this well this is now a word of length uh, length the original length minus 2 right because the two of the b's disappeared from this list so this fellow has length equal to length of w minus 2 which is strictly smaller than the length of w okay so now since i'm doing induction on the length of w now i'm done because this is again of the form some word uh, which has a's and b's well you may worry a little bit about the fact that you know i've assumed there aren't two successive a's or b's but you'll notice that if these dots uh, actually existed if if say this next dot was actually a letter that letter would be an a okay which would further cancel this a or if if the one before it was a b again that would further cancel the b and what's left is still again of the same form okay so there is just a tiny little bit that you will have to do to convince yourself that the argument works without a problem but uh, it does and so what we have done is by induction the proof is done Okay, so uh, which implies done by induction. Okay, so what does that mean? We have shown that any coset uh, of any word, therefore, is has to coincide with one of these six cosets, one through six, which means that our original claim was proved. Therefore, we have managed to prove. We have proved that f by n has at most six elements okay and therefore we have proved the the original thing we set out to prove which is that uh, and hence we have shown that the kernel of this map the the original map was exactly the normal subgroup generated by just those three elements those three relations okay so this this fact that we have shown that f modulo the you know the 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 normal subgroup generated by a square b square and ab so i'll just use this this sort of angled bracket here to say normal subgroup generated by them so we have shown this is s3 this is sometimes uh, expressed as follows we say s3 is uh, the group uh, on the generators so we say S3 has two generators A and B and relations. So relations is the new word here which says uh, what's in the kernel A square, B square and AB whole cubed. Sorry, this should be a cubed here. Okay, so there are two generators and three relations between them. Uh, they give you a nice uh, presentation is, uh, is the other word uh, this is suppose this is sometimes called a presentation of s3 on two generators and three relations okay 